you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. This morning we'll have the scripture uh, on the screen for you that we'll be looking at. Two particular ones today, Hebrews chapter 4. And uh, we will be looking there and also in Matthew uh, chapter 11 verse 28. It's, it's fair to say that I've been looking forward to today all week long. But that's not new. It's fair to say I look forward to Sunday every week. Uh, it has been the most favorite day of my life. It is a day where anything can happen. It is a day that I can walk in one way and walk out another. It's a, it's a day where change can happen in a prayer, in a scripture, in a song, in a sermon, through the Lord. Anything can happen and everything and anything is possible. Do you believe that this morning? Yes. I think most of you do, or you wouldn't really be here. I'm really glad to see you. It's good to see a lot of folks here this morning. Thanks for being out, coming out, and uh, we're trusting God for protection and taking all the precautions that we can. But it's not just that I love this day, but I love this place. It's not just that I love this day and I love this place, but I love you and I love what God does in your lives and I love that we can get together either here or at home, and be the body of Christ. Amen? And I love the church. Uh, Gordon MacDonald, in a book that he wrote several years ago, I think it was called Who Stole My Church, was, was sitting by a bunch of seminarians, and they were saying that they're going to work in parachurch organizations when they get out of seminary. They're not going to work in the church, and they don't like the church, and the church bothers them. And he came up to them, and I think you heard them or another professor say, it's interesting that you don't like the church, but Jesus loved the church and died for it. The scripture doesn't say that generally. The, the scripture says that specifically, that Jesus loved the church and died for it. That's us. We're the church. And he loved us and died for us. And I love the church. And I've heard people say, and maybe um, you've heard me say recently, uh, that, you know, there's a lot, I've been hurt in church and you know, and I don't want to come because I've been hurt in church. And can I just remind us that if we are hurt in church, we are hurt by the flesh of the church, not by the spirit of the church, not by what the church really is. But, you know, sometimes we, we get testy. We're people, all right? Sometimes Tommy goes, Bob, and I go, what? <laughs> Instead of going, what, honey? <laughs> and sometimes we can be that way with each other, but it's the flesh of the church that hurts the church. It's not the spirit of the church. The church never hurts anybody. You've heard me also say that I've been asked many times as a presbyter to preside in churches that are having really strong difficulties, and they say that our church is going to split. And I said, that's not possible. Churches can't split. The body of Christ can't split. Now, two people, two groups of people with different factions and in the flesh, they can split, but the church can't split. Amen? The church is here. Church is here to stay. The church is what God loves and what he died for. And we are the church. This building is not the church. We are the church. And I love this place. I love what God is doing in this place and in our lives. In Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 11. And we have been on this for a while now. That's great. I thought by now, as we study through Hebrews, by now we would be probably in chapter 11. <laughs> yeah, chapter 4, thankfully, we are in. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, his rest still stands. Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they heard, those who heard it did not combine it with faith. They just heard the word, they didn't combine it with faith. Now we who have believed entered the rest just as God has said, so I declare to my oath and my anger they will never in, that they will never enter my rest, speaking of the children of Israel at that time. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all of his work. And again, in the passage above, he said, they shall never enter that rest. It still remains that some of you will enter the rest. And those who formerly had the gospel preached them did not go in because of their disobedience. I'm going to stop there because our focus is this place that says, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest 
still stands is that God invites us to his rest and we shall enter it. And Jesus said, come unto me, in Matthew, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Now this is kind of a theme of the service. I, was, I, was, I wrote down what I felt the word of the Lord was saying today. Of course, I've been dwelling on this for a number of weeks. So that's in my heart. That's in my spirit. And I wasn't surprised that when the word of the Lord came to me this morning that it had those words in it. But I guarantee you this. If one of our other families or friends who are here would have stood up this morning and given a word of the Lord, either in tongues interpretation or a prophetic word, I guarantee you that somewhere along the line he would be into this theme. Because God has a theme that he's speaking to us about. And let's not miss it. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke fits perfectly and the burden I give you is light. The first thing I want you to notice and understand is the invitation is for you. It's a wide open invitation. Whosoever will, anybody that is weary and carry heavy burdens and perhaps that describes some of us today. Jesus invites and Jesus says to all who are weary and burdened, and weary literally means those who are exhausted from their hard labor. It describes those who collapse in bed at the end of the day, weary from the day's trials or the day's work. Now there's lots of weariness that we can experience in our world today. I'm gonna to cover a few of those this morning. The first one is emotional weariness. Let's start there, emotional weariness. Some of us uh, recognize that we lack a little peace in our lives. We worry about things, and then if we don't have something to worry about, we worry about why we're not worrying about something. And it sometimes can become, you know, a comforting bedfellow. It can become, worry can become so much a part of us that we're comforted in the worry. And that sound, might sound weird, but maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. And we can doubt that anything good can even come into our lives and we worry about where we are. Corey Ten Boom once wrote, worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrows, it empties today of success. And may I also say, it empties today of our joy. There is a very strong correlation to the amount of worry that we have in our life and the amount of joy that we have in our life. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that there are days when you're worrying about something and your joy is just like gone? Where's my joy? Well, it's being overshadowed by your worry because joy is God's joy and worry is your worry. Your worry is the wet blanket on your joy. You can tweet that all you want. I just made that up right now. But your worry becomes that wet blanket of your joy. It just... Whoosh. One time I was at a place and it caught on fire and they took a blanket in the sink and wet it and then threw it on the fire and then the fire just went out. I was like, wow. And I think sometimes we walk around, those wet blankets are just our worry. And it's like I sometimes hear God say to me, he didn't say it to you because he likes you better maybe, but he says, knock it off. But sometimes maybe he says to you, your worry is not useful, let it go. But I just hear these words, knock it off. And I, and I have to do that. And I have to consciously do that. If one of my kids were traveling today, guess what I'm going to be thinking of when, we're, when I'm preaching the word? I'm trying not to, but I'm going to worry to make sure they're going to make it home. Because they always come home on Sunday for work on Monday. And I, I, I can remember times when, before I step to the pulpit, I have to say, Lord, Stop it with me, please. Help me stop worrying. They're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. Let it go. And sometimes I think we just need to let it go. There was a woman that I was reading about not too long ago that for 40 years she worried that she might die of cancer. And finally at age 70 she died of pneumonia. She was worrying about the wrong thing for 40 years. There are emotional stresses and they can wear us out. It's good to see Bud and Sherry here. Not only are they stressed physically because they're moving and have been moving and remodeling a house and unbelievable stuff, but it gets to you guys. We've been praying for you because that's a lot of stress. That's a lot of emotional 
you know, it just, it just is. You know, I told Sandra, I, I'm hoping we never have to move again. And we've been in our house next in a couple of weeks, it'll be 20 years. I'm hoping to never have to move again because I have a lot of stuff to move, a lot of records and books and lots of things. And it's like, I don't ever want to do that because it's, it's not just physically weary, it's emotionally weary. It is. And I know that that's important for us to consider. Our emotions are important for us to consider. So we think about emotional weariness, but let me talk about physical exhaustion. There's also physical stresses that exhaust us. And it's not just working and, and doing a, a really hard day's work, but it's not enough sleep. It's too much of something and not enough of another, too little exercise. It could be poor nutrition, uh, too much noise and hurrying about, trying to fit two or three things in the same space of time. Anybody guilty of that here? Yeah. I think we could all raise our hands at those things. We got too many things going. Sometimes my head just spins because I'm married to Sandra. <laughs> and she is like a whirlwind of industry. Even when she comes to bed, she doesn't go to sleep. She's making lists, she's scratching things off, she's doing all kinds of stuff. She's, some of you received your prayer request notice at three o'clock in the morning or 2.30 in the morning. And it's not that she woke up and, oh, I forgot to send that. She was working on it and then sent it. We can do a great deal of damage to our bodies because we are a whole person. We are whole people. In other words, because we are body, soul, and spirit, our physical exhaustion could lead us down an emotional path of depression or a low place in our lives. Our physical uh, lack of physical rest can actually do that to us. Now remember, who was it that designed us this way? It was God who designed us this way. It is God who designed us after a big day of physical or stressful work that we fall back into our bed into a deep sleep because we're exhausted and tired from the day. He made our physical life affect our emotional life, and all of our emotional life is connected to our spiritual well-being as well. Another kind of exhaustion, and I'm just coming to realize, is called political exhaustion. Okay, not really. I just put that in there for fun. But I'm politically exhausted. I'm politically exhausted. At this point, who cares? Just bring it. Let's go. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. God knows he's in charge. Guess what? He's in charge. Do you hear me? God says in his word, he puts leaders in the positions. He's got a plan within a plan within a plan. Your plan doesn't even fit. It's so minuscule compared to his plan. His plan is deep and wide. Deep and wide. And wider still is his plan. So it's kind of like the song in the scripture that says, come what may. Come what may. I mean, I like come what may. I like bring it. I like just do it. There's lots of sayings I like. But I just know this, God's in charge. I'm not. And I'm comforted by that. And so should you be. Because if I was in charge, things would be bad. <laughs> no doubt about it. We would all, the, the church would be a beach, just sand and beach chairs. <laughs> and shorts and heat. This idea of spiritual weariness is important too. Because there are spiritual stresses as well. The weight of sin and the, the weight of the struggle to overcome our sin can take a hold upon our life and can lead us into some times of spiritual exhaustion. Now, I tried, when I first became a Christian, they told me that I was free from sin. They told me that morning, you are free from sin. That Satan has broken the chains of sin in your life and you are free of that. I thought they said that now that you're a Christian, you're not going to sin anymore. And they've heard my story. Some of you haven't, so let me briefly tell you that I thought that meant I was free of sin. And I remember about the third or fourth week of my salvation when they were having this thing called testimonies. 
Google it, testimonies. And uh, we stood up and testified what God was doing on Sunday night. And I thank the Lord. And we'd stand up. And the next person would stand up. It was great. And it was awesome. We got to hear from the body. It was so cool. And I said, I thank God that I don't sin anymore. I thank God that he freed me from all my sin and that sin's behind me and I am free and I haven't sinned for a month. I'm so thankful to the Lord. And of course, my pastor, as was his habit, said, Bobby, can I see you after service? (laughs) What that meant was I did something wrong, which, you know, it's like my mom calling me Robert Mark. You know, I knew I did something wrong. And so... I'd come after you and said, Bobby, we, we still sin. I go, you do? <gasps> You're the pastor. You should not be doing that. You're supposed to be free from sin. That's what they told me. That old guy at the altar right there, that 35-year-old guy, that old man told me, I am free of sin. He said, no, Bobby, we, we, we still sin. We're just forget. I go, no, no, no. It's been a month. I haven't sinned at all. He said, oh, I'm sure you have. I go, I know I have it. Show me where I've sinned. I, I haven't. I've not. I mean, it was a long time. I mean, I almost think it might have been a couple, two or three months because I did not sin. I didn't yell at my mom or my dad. I didn't call them names under my breath. I didn't roll my eyes at everybody. I didn't steal anything. I hadn't lied about anything. I didn't beat anybody up or get beat up. I was flying right and straight. But then my pastor set me straight. And told me that as Christians, we still sin. So, of course, what did I do? I began sinning. And I've been sinning ever since. But I had a time, a sweet time, when spiritually I was not burdened by sin because I wasn't doing it. Now, guess what? That was temporary, and you know that. It would have been temporary because pretty soon I would have sinned. I mean, I think I was just so happy in Jesus that nothing else mattered. And can I just tell you, if you're happy in Jesus, nothing else really matters. You don't have to lie or cheat or steal or think bad things about people because all you're doing is thinking about Jesus and what he did in your life and the change that he made. And it was remarkable. And I wasn't mad at my alcoholic father anymore. Every time he came in the room, I used to want to just punch him. And I didn't even have it anymore. God took it all away. It was so wonderful. I didn't care about the girls and the girl that invited me to church because I thought if I went to church, she'd be my girlfriend. And once I got saved, I forgot about her. I mean, I know her name, but she had no hold on me. That witchy woman. No, no, it was her style of evangelism, I think. Find a boy, bring him to church, get him to Jesus, and then go on to the next guy. It worked beautifully. But God had a plan for me. How did he get me to church? He got me to church by my own weakness, right? I don't care how I got there. I'm just glad I got there. Because what he did for me was amazing and wonderful. And it set me on a path. And I have been on a path to be back to that place where I sin less and less and less. And it should like this, be like this. The longer you're saved, the less you should be sinning. Hello? The longer you're in Jesus, the less you should be sinning. Why? Because you should be learning how to defeat the enemy. You should be learning how to say no to temptation. Now, every other temptation is going to come. When I was younger, the temptation, you know, was, were things like, you know, girls, you know, having somebody in my life, you know, that was a temptation and lust of the flesh. That was something pride of life, you know, lust of the eyes. These are all things, but you know, they do change after a while. They do change, but I still have temptations. They're just different temptations. It's not just because of my age. It's just that I learned to say no to that temptation a long time ago. Because I know that's trouble. ain't going there. What about you? Do you see yourself progressing in your spiritual life? But sometimes we get exhausted because we are not perfect and we do sin. I wonder sometimes, what kind of sin does Jalea have? Jalea? What kind of sin do you have, dear? Nancy McConnell? I I got nothing for you. I got nothing for you. Lola? (laughs) Too sweet. Too sweet. Think of a sin for Lynn Ross. Or Jan Almay. Jan, seriously. (laughs) What is it? Where is your sin? 
Caitlin, don't look at me like that, girl, because I'm looking at you going, Where, where's your sin, girl? You're so sweet and kind. I mean, I just look around the room, right? And I'm like, what is it? You know, where, where would your sin be if you had a, you know, it's like, wow, but you have them. And I'm glad you didn't shout them out, but you could have. It would have surprised all of us except not God. Because he knows, right? He knows. But there can be a weariness there. And this last stress of spiritual weariness is one at times we don't fully appreciate. But I believe that Jesus was directly speaking about this kind of spiritual weariness when he was talking about that. Because there's a weariness of trying to have a good life in one's own strength and energy that is difficult. You will fail time and time again, and that can really be a drag. That can really drag you down. You're trying to do good. Have you ever had that time where you're, you're trying to do good, you think you're on a roll, and all of a sudden you just to totally fall flat on your face? Something unexpected comes up in a way you just didn't think was going to be there, and all of a sudden stuff is going through your head and your mind and your mouth that you never even thought was going to happen? It just surprised you and hijacked you? Goodness gracious. It's a crazy thing. And our world gives us lots of opportunities to spiritually be burdened and bogged down because of things that just keep coming at us. You know, I'm glad my phone is bringing the word of God to everybody because it also has a porn part of it that I never exercise on my phone, but I'm telling you it's there because I deal with people every week that have issues about what they're doing on their phone. I saw a thing the other day that had some kind of phone sanitizing. And I said, yes, please. But I'm telling you, it's not the phone physically, it's the phone spiritually that bothers me. One of my favorite things is when Apple comes on and tells me, your phone usage is down this week. I'm like, sweet. I mean, I feel like, yeah, I read three chapters more of my Bible than I normally do. I'm feeling good. Because that thing can make me weary spiritually. It can get me down, especially when I look at posts. Posts. Holy cow. I understand why people give up Facebook, why they give up Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and every other personal thing you can think of, because I'm telling you, it makes you weary spiritually. I told you guys many years ago that I wanted to invent Facebook. It's Facebook with a list. Facebook. I want Facebook. And I want you all to join my Facebook. And when you get on there, guess what? You can post all you want about your food. But your opinions? Eh, censored. Just like they're doing now. <laughs> but in my Facebook, it would be through the Holy Spirit. The other thought I had was, why don't I make an account that says Holy Spirit? An anonymous account called the Holy Spirit. And then every time you post something that I wish you hadn't posted, the Holy Spirit would tell you, here's what the Bible says and here's what God thinks about what you just posted. Anonymous. Nobody knows it's Pastor Bob. But Facebook said, no, you cannot have the Holy Spirit because you are not him. But I thought it would be fun. But sometimes I get weary. You know, the one thing I think, to, think about in that scripture, they use the word burdened. That's a really good word because the sin that besets us is a burden. It's a burdening sin. I talk to people all the time about the burden to have. One, one woman not too long ago was burdened because she found herself finding solace in her life uh, shopping online and getting packages every day. And she said that a package that comes to my door, and you know what I'm talking about, because every time I see that truck going by, I'm like, oh, they might be coming to drop a package up at my house. No, it's just a Katie. Or it's Dave coming home in the truck. It's just to give love to his family. But we all know what that's like. But to her, it was an emotional and spiritual almost charge that she got when she got a package. And, but, but it was a burden. It was, it was dragging them down in so many ways. I think this spiritual burden thing drags us down in those kind of ways. 
So there is a sin that so easily besets me. And it is a sin that I come by naturally. And it's the idea of handling stuff on your own and not needing help and being everything to everybody and trying to do and just doing a lot of things on my own. I grew up in a family that it wasn't safe to ask for help. Because asking for help was a vulnerable statement. By saying, I need help, you're saying, I'm vulnerable and I can't do it all. You hear that, right? And I have been preaching for many years now the, the, the virtue of vulnerability and the need for vulnerability. I did not have it growing up. You did not share your vulnerabilities in my family or in my community. Now that was passed on to me from my mom. And I know that I passed it on to my kids. And they may have it less than me, but they still run until they drop. And they still do everything on their own as much as they can without asking for help. I worked for one of my best friends in life and my, one of my, my best mentors, Don Gregg, for 16 years in two different churches. He was just like that too. Strength. Just strength, all, not just physical strength, but, but strength to just keep going and just keep moving through things and, and just do what you've got to do. Now, he, he came from a very different family than mine. Mine was an alcoholic family, where you understand where it's, you know, it's very dysfunctional. And you would expect that in a family of dysfunction, that not having vulnerability, not sharing your emotions, or not asking for help when you need it. But he came from a pastor's home, a very different kind of home than what I came from. But can I just tell you that through all my studies as a psychologist, I recognize that in holiness families, there's also a, a kind of a similarity between holiness families and alcoholic families. Because there, is, there exists this idea of denial. In holiness families, they're, they're denying their, their humanity which is a good thing, right? Until it's not. It's a good thing to deny your humanity until it's not a good thing when you need to ask for help or you need to be vulnerable. Then it's not such a good thing. Now in my pastor's family, uh, his family was incredibly hardworking. And I know because I worked for his father, Frank Gregg, at Roar Aircraft. And I worked for Frank and I knew him as Pastor Frank. He had started the church I got saved in, and he had come several times, had been our interim pastor between pastors. And he was, he was a great pastor. He was a very strong individual. So I was in the warehouse for two or three days at Roar Aircraft doing my job and talking with other people and doing their job. And then all of a sudden, one day, I saw this flurry of activity. I mean, these guys that were kind of doing their job and kind of laid back, all of a sudden stepped it up like double time. I wonder what in the world got into these guys. And all of a sudden, here comes Frank Gregg walking through their supervisor in charge of all the warehouse. So he came walking. Everybody was like, busy, 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 busy. And I just walk up and go, oh, hi, Frank, how you doing, buddy? And I walk up to him, and people are looking at me like, oh, he's going to get it. He's going to get it, you know, but I didn't. But I was already working hard. I didn't need someone to tell me. I wasn't afraid of any supervisor. I generally worked circles around my supervisors. But Frank, when every time he came around, people started working really hard. Sandra's dad is one of these kinds of people also. Sandra's dad is one of the hardest working men I've ever met in my life. He works circles around most people, even today, and he's in his 80s. And he will still work and work until he literally drops of physical exhaustion or heat or something. But some folks, that's what's hardwired in them. You know what I'm talking about? You know some of those folks who just, just go, 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 go? And with this kind, these kind of influences in one's life, uh, it's hard for us to ask for help. It's hard for us to say that we can't do it all or that we need some help doing that. Because where I grew up in Chula Vista, if you asked for help or showed weakness, guess what? You were gone. You were taken advantage of. You know, you couldn't be weak. You had to just keep doing that. Now, all of my pastors that I worked for were very driven men, not given over easy to rest, maybe even Sabbath rest. 
You see, recognizing our need for rest in today's world is counterintuitive. If we rest, guess what? The next guy is going to get above us. If we rest, guess what? They're going to think that we are slackers. If we rest, guess what? They're, someone else is going to come in and walk all over us. Saying that I need rest is a vulnerable statement. You tracking with me today? Saying I can't do it all is a vulnerable statement. Saying that I can't live a perfect life is a vulnerable statement. Saying I need help spiritually is a vulnerable statement. I asked one lady if I can pray for her. She said, yes, she was so burdened. I said, why didn't you come down for elders prayer this morning? She said, I didn't want people to think I had a need. Are you kidding me? Where do you get a message like that? You're a person. Guess what? I already know you got a need. You're a person. Guess what? I know you got a past. You're a person. Guess what? There's a history that follows you. Guess what? God knows all of this. And so does everybody else. So knock it off and just be who you are. It doesn't mean a license to sin. Of course not. The scripture says, heaven forbid. But all this is recognizing I need help and I need God's help. And when I need God's help, he's always there. The word of the Lord this morning. You are never alone, ever. I am with you. Come unto me. Are you burdened? I'm here. Transfer your burdens for my yoke. It is easy. It is light. It's yours for the asking. Ask of me. This is a God who says, listen, I know who you are. I made you. And it's cool. I like you. I love in the book, The Shack, when anytime you mention any individual who's a Christian, oh, I'm particularly fond of that one. <coughs> what about Esten? Oh, I'm particularly fond of that one. Oh, really? What about now? Oh, I'm particularly fond. I love that. I love that because God is particularly fond of each one of us. Hmm. Some of us have a hard time, you know, tracking with that and incorporating that in our lives. Now, I wish I was as pretty as Joel Osteen and had a biggest smile and a big everything and could just tell you, you're great, but I know you. You are great, but you got issues, people. <laughs> you got issues. And it's a sin thing. It's a spiritual issue. But the good news of the gospel is I've got a remedy for that. His name is Jesus. It's appropriated by the blood of Jesus. And if you accept that, guess what? You accept the work of the heavens on your behalf. On your behalf. That's wonderful. You have the heaviest hitter in the universe on your side who's particularly fond of you. Even in your sin, he came and found you. Even in your big messiness, he came and found you. I was laughing yesterday, sitting next to AJ and Matt. And Barrett came in as he had been walking back and forth and comes by me and I was like, ooh, oh my. <laughs> AJ picks him up and says, Grandma, Barrett wants you. <laughs> Barrett needs an answer. He goes, does he have a messy diaper? I mean, she knew. <laughs> and, uh, you know, AJ's like passing her off. You know, it's like, we all got messy diapers, people. <laughs> we all do. And there's a, a Nancy-like God that says, I'll take care of you. I'll clean you up. One of my presbyter friends growing up was uh, an older guy, and um, there was a pastor out east of us in, uh, in the east county of San Diego that was very critical of this presbyter, very critical all the time. I didn't understand why. He seemed like a nice guy to me. And then one day he got sick, and he got so sick he couldn't preach in his church. He was messing himself, and he was throwing up. He was terrible. It was a horrible thing. He was embarrassed and he didn't know what to do. He called, his wife called the presbyter. The presbyter sent somebody out there to preach and the presbyter then left his church that morning to somebody else and went out to that pastor's home and got him out of bed and cleaned him up 
and washed his dirtiness off of him, got him some, uh, some things to drink and some aspirin and put him back to bed and messed again and he cleaned him up again. Guess what? That's the last bad word that man ever had to say about that presbyter. What's the difference? Can I just tell you? Vulnerability. He allowed that presbyter to see him in his most vulnerable state. That's the most vulnerable state ever, by the way, that I can imagine. And he allowed the presbyter to see that. And the presbyter came and made no mention of it, and made no problem about it, just came in and did what a servant of God will do and took care of that and became an uh, influence of God in even a pastor's life. And that was the last bad word I ever had to say. I'm telling you, when I hear people badmouth God, I know they have no idea who God is. You tracking with me? They have no idea who God is. And people that badmouth the church have no idea what the church is. Because what they saw was just a bunch of people mucking about, making a mess in their diapers in the pew instead of listening to the word of God and what God has to say. Because the church of God and the people of God represent God on this earth. And if we're not, we're in trouble and we got a messy diaper. Sometimes people come around me and I can smell it. I said, they got a messy diaper. And God is saying, stick with them, help them, clean them up, be there. But you know what? I don't think there's anything worse than anybody having a smelly diaper, but not knowing they have a smelly diaper. This year, I, I was telling Bobby the story. It's a terrible story for a pastor to tell on a Sunday morning, but I'm going to tell it. And we were standing at the tomb of Tutankhamun, and, and, and here's King Tut, and he's there. And he's in this enclosure, and there's ventilation in the enclosure of some kind. We don't know what, but we're standing there. And a couple of guys that were with us on our tour, young guys, funny guys, I love these guys. And one of them, dinner did not set well with them the night before, and it was just like a, a mess. It was like a, a, a smoke bomb had gone off, you know, a stink bomb had gone off. And he was apologizing for it, but these ladies came up, these sweet ladies came up, and, and they're looking at King Tut and go, oh, he smells terrible. <laughs> he smells terrible. And I, the more I stood there, the more I said, he is stinking. It's like Lazarus, when he came out of the tomb, he goes, he's been dead for three days, and he stinketh. And King James, and he stinketh. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know, but the guy's brother that was standing right next to him knew it because he's familiar with his stinkage. <laughs> and the ladies walked away, and he looked at me and goes, are you kidding me? What are you thinking about? We're in an enclosed space. He goes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. What do you mean you couldn't help it? This whole thing is stinking. They're going to go home saying King Tut stinks. Their whole trip was almost ruined. Their eyes were watering. <laughs> Pastor Bob was ready to pass out. When you don't know you stink is one thing. When you know you stink, it's another thing. I had lunch with John, Pastor John, the other day from Lewisburg, and we're getting ready to go, and he goes, oh, by the way, you got some barbecue sauce in your beard. Now, you can't hide beard in a, a barbecue sauce in a white beard, okay? You know, that's about, there's not much you can hide in a white beard. Some of you that have dark beards, you know, Matt's beard, you know, you can have a Pontiac in there, you never see it, but, but you know, you, if you have a beard, it's light color, and I said, well, you know, I wanted to say, John, we've been driving for 15 minutes, how long did I have that barbecue sauce in my beard, when I was paying the bill with the waitress and smiling real big? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how much barbecue sauce, and I took my napkin, I had it in my car, and I wiped it off, it was a lot of barbecue sauce. <laughs> People tell me when I have barbecue sauce, and if I stink, tell me. Okay? Now, don't let it be your opinion that I stink, but only if I really stink. I'm, op I'm open to that. It's not just Sandra that can tell me that I stink. It's all of us that we can say, hey. So here's my issue, as I mentioned to you, with being with driven men and being a driven man. You recognize it's hard to, to ask for help. And expressing an inner desire sometimes does not match the people around me, so, so, so if I do that, I'm weak. I thought it was wonderful that when Jesus was at the, at the well, 
uh, and the woman of the well story, when he stopped at the well and he said, hey guys, will you go into town and get some food because I'm really tired, I'm going to rest here. The Son of God was walking with all these guys and the Son of God said, I'm kind of tired, I'm going to rest here. Now he had an appointment, a divine appointment, but regardless, he let them know that he was tired and they all went off to get food. Now I'm sure Peter had a few wise words to say you know, to the other disciples. You know, we've been walking the same thing, too. I've got plenty of energy. I, I've got more energy than the Son of God. I'm going to just keep on going. That's just Peter for you, you know. And John, the beloved, is probably saying, now, Pete, listen, it's okay. Jesus just has, you know, uh, the whole world on his shoulders. Let's help him out here. Let's just go get him some food. Uh, but Jesus will often say, as he was ministering to people on the edge of a lake, and they just kept coming and coming, and their burdens were so many. And Jesus finally said, I have to go away for a few months. He got on the boat and rode away. What? Jesus couldn't just heal all their needs? Jesus is always teaching, folks. He's always teaching things like the Sabbath was made for you, not you for the Sabbath. He's always telling you that uh, through his heavenly Father, that on the seventh day he rested. It's an example to us. If you were weak where I came from, you were dead. You were dead meat. So is it any wonder, given all these factors, that God made a set of codes for his people to follow? The code said, on Friday night, just before sunset, until an hour after sunset on Saturday night, about 25 hours, I want you to take a Sabbath rest. Because at, at the end of 25 hours, Saturday night is kind of too late to do any work. So it really probably effectively lasted about a rest of about 35 hours. If they're working 40 hours a week and they got 35 to 40 hours of rest, that's a pretty great, pretty balanced life. You see, that was the law. That was the law that God gave to man at that time. And it was like this. Whatever your tendencies were, if you were hard driving because of your family of origin or hard driving because of the way you're wired, however you're hardwired, whatever it is that you have a tendency to do, whatever your strengths are, whatever those things happen to be, I don't care because on Friday night, I want you to rest until Saturday night. Everybody had to do it. You could be an overachiever, a hard driver, whatever. God made you rest. He said, this is what you do. But we are so much smarter than God, right? I mean, let's just keep pushing. Let's just keep driving. Keep forcing more and more of our lives and into our lives, into the lives of our family. Let's have a couple of side hustles just to make some extra money so that we can go someplace and rest. Uh, let's get everybody working, working, working. Let's, you know, life goes too fast. People, let's go. Let's get moving. Uh, I mean, life does go fast. Jasper is driving for the love of Pete. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Where did that go? How did that happen? He was just telling me at a restaurant, it seemed like a few months ago, Papa, why are my eyes dripping? He hit a straw on the roof of his mouth and his eyes reacted. And he said, Papa, why are my eyes dripping? Oh man, now that kid's driving. One of my friends said that uh, the older you get, the shorter the day, or the longer the days are and the shorter the years are. It's like the days go long and the years go fast. It's an amazing thing what happens in life. Hmm. But let me tell you, standing here before you, that had I had my life in order, in the way that God wanted it ordered, I wouldn't be standing here today. I would be sitting where um, a youth pastor of this church would sit, because that's what I would be doing. Because 26 years ago, I was in the office in the gym and I had just finished a retreat for our youth group. I, I did notebooks, I'm big notebooks, you know, my notes are like notebooks, you know. And I had all these, this notebook, I closed the notebook on this retreat. And I said, oh, all right, Lord, another retreat, gonna be great. And the Lord said, uh, are you going to invite me on that retreat? I said, well, what do you mean, Lord? Of course, you're the guest of honor. He said, well, that's interesting, because I haven't even been asked about this retreat. I said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I got it. You know, I've been doing this for 24, 25 years. I've been a youth pastor. You've trained me. You've equipped me. You've gifted me. I got it. It's good. He said, well, that's great. 
He said, enjoy this youth retreat because it will be your last. I was like, am I going to die? <laughs> no, I was like, I knew what he meant. He said, it'll be your last retreat. And he said, now you're going to be done with youth work. And I said, wait, wait, Lord, wait a minute. I have studied everything in my life and every egg I have is in the basket of youth ministries. Do not do that for me. Don't do that to me. I, I don't want a pastor. I don't want to be a senior pastor. You know how those people are. They look at you and they judge you. And they hold up signs at the end. Seven, five. Then the sound room guys, 10. Thank you for that, Lonnie. I appreciate it. Never forget it. It was like Cully McCulkin no moment in Home Alone. I did not want to do that. I hadn't studied that. I felt ill-equipped. And God said, well, good. Then you won't try to do it on your own. Because I love being a youth pastor. And I felt I was a really good youth pastor. And I had great success as a youth pastor. But when you can do it on your own, guess what? It's time to do something else. So pastoring is a whole different animal. It's related to the other animals, but it's a different animal. And where before, you know, I mean, I was trained to turn out lights, but most youth pastors, you know, a few excluded, um, really never turned out lights because they never really saw the electric bill. You know, I don't remember Melvin ever going by and saying, Bob, you left the lights on again. I maybe have, but I, I don't remember that because I was pretty good at doing that. I was trained differently. But you know, there's other needs in the church and I, I was focused on these, but God said, if you can do this on your own, then you're done. So guess what I make sure of? I make sure that I am pastoring in his strength and not mine. I don't want to preach my word. I want to preach his word. And I want his word, which is this word, the one I wrote down today, this morning. I want this word to match this word. Now, it would have been a better, better illustration if one of you had gave a message in tongues and gave this word. Because it seems like, oh, that's very convenient, Pastor Bob. You gave this word and it matched that word. Oh, that's no big secret. Okay, I'm not trying to manipulate. You know me. I didn't even want to give this word. I wrote it down, but I didn't want to give it. Because I knew what I was speaking about. And I didn't want it to be discounted by the fact. And I know you're not discounting me. I know that. And I know that you know that I, I'm, this is, I'm trying to hear the word of God every day. And, and I, I finish my sermon most, most weeks on Thursday. By Thursday, my desire is to get my sermon done on Thursday. But can I tell you, I have never, to my knowledge, delivered a sermon that I finished on Thursday that was the same and I preached on Sunday. And if I didn't change the words of it like I did even today by printing another one of these because God added a page or so uh, to me for this weekend, if I didn't do that, when I get up here to speak it, guess what? God changes it at the moment I begin speaking it. Here's what I want you to know. If, if you took the transcript of what I'm speaking to you today and then you took my notes and read through my notes, you're not going to see more than half or three, a quarter to, to a third maybe, maybe half the words that are on the transcript are on my page. The one good thing about Pentecost people and, and, and Pentecostal people is that we listen to God and God speaks through us if we'll let him. Because we say this, God, I need your help today. There's never a time I stand before this pulpit and you say, oh, Pastor Bob, that's not a pulpit. We used to have a real pulpit. Now you have a table. That's a table. It's the desk of God. It's the sacred desk. It's the table. It's the pulpit. It doesn't matter. I'm standing behind it. And it's the word of God. And there's never a time that I give you what I want only. God slips stuff in all the time. Now, I knew I was going to talk about my pastor today. And so I texted him before the message. If, if you're watching, Don, how you doing, buddy? I miss you. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm, I may talk about you and your father today <laughs> in my sermon. Because <laughs> he watches from time to time, and I want to give him a heads up about that. But I want you to know something, that when God speaks to us, whether it's an imperfect vessel like me, or a beautiful song that tells us how we need to be, we should listen and attend our ears 
to what God is saying. And not just to what God is saying, but what the people around you might share with you or say to you, or what Rob would pray, or Dave would pray, or Sandra would say and speak, or whatever. Listen to those words, folks. See if they have meaning to you. Attend to what God is doing. So I recognize that my dependency must be on God and not on my own strength. And this is what he's saying in the beginning of the sermon I read to you, that these people, they're doing it without faith. They're doing it in rote. They're doing it just the way they've always done it. They're not listening, and faith is not interacted. The message that I give to you every Sunday is a message of faith. I say it like this. When I bring this out on Thursday night, and I put it on my pulpit, and I put it there Thursday night, and I say, Lord, as I'm walking from a printer to this desk, and I I say, Lord, may these words be your words, and if they're not your words, strike them from my page and from my memory and give me new words to say. Because this is not a static document. It's a dynamic presentation. You tracking with me? It's dynamic, and this is what God is going to say. Now, I know what some people say, because I've heard it. Well, sometimes, Pastor Bob, you go down a rabbit trail. And I would say, blazed by the Spirit of God. Blazed by the Spirit of God. You say, well, Pastor Bob, sometimes your stories, like that one, that guy, you know, uh, you know, tootin', if I say it that way, tootin' at Tootin' on Commons, that, that story, there's nothing spiritual about that story, Pastor Bob. That story's a nasty story. We're at home trying to eat our breakfast and our coffee, and you're telling stories about toots. That cannot be from the Holy Spirit. That's a rabbit trail, Pastor Bob. And you can say that all you want. But guess what? There was somebody that was going to come to me and tell me that I really wasn't listening to what you're saying until you told that toot story. And then it made me kind of soften up to what you had to say. And then God went boom. Without that toot story, I wouldn't have the boom. <laughs> My superintendents can watch this. I mean, But he knows me. He knows my heart. And I know God. That's all I need to know. He uses imperfect vessels every stinking day. Because it's all of us. He uses us every single day if we'll let him. Imperfect vessels, yes, that's you and I. The perfection of our spirit as I've mentioned many times, a perfect heart is one that responds to God, doesn't do everything perfectly. Now, I can't imagine Paige doing anything wrong. Paige, I'm sorry, but I can't imagine you doing anything wrong. That guy next to you, though, I've seen it. Okay? But Paige is like, she's just the sweetest, kindest, says the neatest things. Amazing. But folks, even Paige needs Jesus. We all do, because we're all imperfect. We think we're smarter than God. We think we know more, but we don't. And God proved that to me by letting me be released from youth ministry to do pastoral ministry, which I never thought I would ever do or ever wanted to do. And now I could do nothing else and I ensure that I'm going to be doing this until I decide, and God decides it's not time for me to stop doing this, or time to stop doing this. I know I'm going to keep doing it because I know that I ask for God's help every day. I ensure that I'm going to be doing what I'm doing because I'm saying to God, I need you. And I do, and so do you. John Bunyan, in his classic work, A Pilgrim's Progress, describes a moment in his character who is called Christian, is freed from the weight of sin. This big pack, remember the book or the movie, he's been carrying this big backpack throughout his journeys, and he came to the cross of Jesus, and at the foot of the cross, uh, the empty tomb, he approaches the cross, and the burdens fall off of his back and is swallowed up by the tomb. So in my, my mind, my imagination, it's like I carry these burdens. I have this big, huge burden on my back at 16 years old. And I come to the altar of God and this big, huge burden falls off me and gets sucked into this tomb, gets sucked into God and totally erased and just consumed and it's gone. 
and I can't ever bring it back. And it's thrown into the sea of forgiveness, never more to be brought up against me ever again. And if you have not experienced that forgiveness, folks, you're missing the greatest moment in life. I'm a Dodgers fan, but a Royals fan first. I've seen both of them win World Series. That's a great moment. I'm a Chiefs fan, and I've seen the Chiefs win the Super Bowl. I'm a Chargers fan, but I'm still waiting. But anyway, I'm a Chiefs fan first. And man, I love that. That's exciting. That's amazing when that happens. But I have to tell you, it is so minuscule. It is like a burr on my foot compared to the joy of having your sins washed away and taken away. Oh, my goodness. Now, to prove to you that I am still in need of God's help. It's 1214. I'm not a good pastor. Because a good pastor, by some people's definition, gets done at five minutes to 12. So if, you, if your definition is that, I'm not a good pastor. But I want to be a godly pastor. So I want to listen to what God says, and he said every word. So this morning... I want us to come to the table of Christ. And my happy meal has disappeared. Oh, there it is. I have resisted in all of my ministry a couple of things. I did not know I'd ever have hand sanitizer on the pulpit. But I've resisted these little cups because there's nothing like passing a cup, a tray of cups, and a tray of bread to the congregation and having them take in that together. I just, I just love that. Not too long ago, um, I went to one of the Castaldi's first communions. I think it was, it might have been the boys, I'm not sure. I've been to, to three of them, I think, there. And they were drinking out of a single cup. I mean, wow, you know. Of course, I forgot that in, I, in the Catholic Church I wasn't supposed to take communion. But I'm like, I, I love Jesus, so I'm taking communion. I didn't know it was wrong because I didn't go to confession. But I went to confession in the morning that I, before I confessed to Jesus, but it's not, not the same. But I forgot they use real wine in the Catholic Church. And I'm, I don't drink, period. And I never want alcohol to touch my lips. And so when I came to the cup, I was like, I have a dilemma. I don't know what to do. I don't want to offend anybody. So your, I don't know, 55-year-old pastor at the time, whatever I was when they had it, he made this noise when he went to the cup. <laughs> I made a sippy cup noise. I made a noise like I was sipping just, just because I didn't want to offend them. I faked her out. She had no idea. <laughs> Something special about communion, isn't there? Do you guys all have your cups and your bread? Okay, now, the first time I did this, I opened up the whole thing. There's two layers to this, okay? The first layer is a thin layer. If you don't have fingernails, good luck with that. <laughs> but the first layer is the bread layer. It's the thin layer, and you, you'll take that first. Oh, I wanted to kind of get us prepared, so let's go ahead and open those up. COVID communion is clunky. If you're at home, some of you have cups, we brought them to you. All right, I just messed mine up. So if you did what I did, now your bread's in a hermetically sealed thing. Just rip it open like this. Maybe. This is why I want you to get it out, because this is terrible. And by the way, it's not even worth it for just this right here, but this is done now. You got your, you got your cup in front of you, you got your bread. All right. At home, you got whatever you're going to use. Some people say, well, Pastor, what should we use? Well, bread and water works great. 
I mean, Dr. Pepper and Doritos, if you got them, I don't know. Um, <laughs> toast and jam. Toast and jam, yeah, something. But we're going to approach this in a moment in a more serious manner because I love communion. For 12 years of my life, I took communion every day. It was a very beautiful, meaningful, symbolic ritual. And then one day I got to work and I wondered, did I, did I remember to take communion? I don't know. I thought, well, then it's not significant, is it? If it's not significant to me, I'm not going to do it. Communion is significant. Is it time when we say, and we follow the Lord, by the way, who told us to do this. So in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he broke it, blessed it, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, you do show the Lord's death until he comes again. In the same manner also, he took the cup. After saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this blood, this drink, this, this wine, this grape juice that we're having today, you do show the Lord's death until he comes again. And he goes on to say something very interesting. He says, but... Let a man examine himself. Let a woman examine herself before she eats the bread and drinks of the cup so that make sure that she eats and drinks and he eats and drinks in a worthy manner. For this cause, there are many who are sick and even some have slept, meaning they've died, because they did not discern the Lord's death. So this morning, a part of our communion at Faith Chapel, and we believe in open communion, meaning if you love Jesus, we want you to take communion with us as we want you to take a moment and see if there's anything between you and God. If there's anything that you have in your way between you and the Lord that would make you unworthy of taking the body and the blood of Jesus. And what are we talking about? We're just talking about sin. We're just talking about attitudes, things that we're involved in. All we have to do is say, Jesus, here's what I'm doing. Forgive me of that, please. I want to take this bread and this blood in a worthy manner. So that's what we're going to do for just a moment. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, we come to you, Lord, this morning to examine ourselves, to see if there be found anything in us, Lord, attitudes, motivations, sins, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, anything, Lord, that fits into those categories, God, that separates us in a way from you, in a way that we do not want ever to happen. And since we have found you, and since we have asked for the forgiveness of our sins, you have always been so close to us. So I ask you, Lord, to prepare our hearts that we might eat in a worthy manner, because we are flesh and blood, and we are spirit. So Lord, I pray that my sins be forgiven. Wash me, cleanse me, Make me white as snow. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Cleanse us, Lord. Though my sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Thank you, Lord. So we have this bread representing his body, which is broken for us. His body, which he said, no man takes it, I lay it down. He laid it down. Lord, we pray that you would bless this bread as we here at the church and at home receive this bread and take it in symbolically as taking in your body, which was given, sacrifice for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may take the bread. Hallelujah. After the same manner, taking the cup. Lord Jesus, thank you for spilling your blood, as this cup represents. I've already said how important the blood of Jesus is to me in my life through silly things of being scared at night, but to greater things of being picked up by tornadoes or threatened with knives or guns or car accidents or all kinds of things. 
evil around me and pleading the blood of Jesus and how strength comes. And Lord, we thank you for your blood. Your word tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so, Lord, we stand here, Lord, with this blood cup in our hand, asking you to forgive us of our sins and thanking you in the month of Thanksgiving to thank you for the fact that you saved us and you gave us your blood. And every drop of blood that was shed, there were tears that were shed in heaven. But Jesus, you laid down your life for us. Your blood covers all of our sin. We thank you for it. And we think of that today. We remember it today. As we take this cup in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may take the cup. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord. It's our first communion we've had together since we've not been together. I had no idea it'd be emotional for me. Hmm. Father, I pray this morning for everyone listening that you would touch them as you've touched me, that you do greater things in them than you've done through me, that you would help us to be vulnerable people who don't have all the answers but know who does. Lord, I don't know what's going to happen this week. There's potential for social unrest like never before. There's potential for all kinds of things to go pretty hinky all over the place. It's likely to be a mess. But we're going to stand firm in you. We're going to walk true to our calling. You are going to let the church be the church. I pray you give us direction and guidance. I pray that today when our folks come to pray, that you would hear their prayers, oh God, even now. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. For neither height nor depth, nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And we call for peace. We call for unity. In the body of Christ first, because you have made us a light sitting upon a hill and cannot be hid. May our light shine as never before. Be with us today, Lord. We love you. We thank you. In the wonderful holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 What a great day. Thank you, folks. We love you. So good to see you all. Have a great day.